Thank you very much. So I have some slides to share, and I was told that I have a reasonable amount of time. So the plan was to share a few slides, and then I can open it up for questions. So we're all here, so we're speaking to the converted, but cannabis, the cannabis plant is a really unique plant because we can make clothing from it, we can put it under our tongues, we can swallow it, we can inhale it. And it's really such a unique botanical medicine, and it's actually so much more than that. And, you know, not just cannabis is, you know, cannabis has really been leading the herbal medicine movement, but herbal medicines are nothing new. In fact, most of the world's population relies on botanical medicines for the majority of their chronic health needs. And that's down to things like cost, availability, cultural preferences. And actually, studies have proven that um, you know, it doesn't have to be either drugs or botanicals. I'm a conventionally trained medical doctor, and I also am an integrated medicine doctor, so I do both. And, <laughs> excuse me. and the interesting thing about botanical medicines is most people who take Western medicine drugs also use some form of natural medicine. And they usually just don't tell their doctors because of fear of reproach or stigma or whatever the, the situation might be. So cannabis has been used for thousands of years. Most of us probably know this. It's been used in ancient China as a medicine and as a fiber for clothing. The Sumerians and the Akkadians used it. The Egyptians used it. Um, in ancient India, in Ayurvedic medicine, it's one of the um, most potent uh, ingredients in most Ayurvedic medicine compounds. I've spent a lot of time in India studying uh, meditation and Ayurvedic uh, Indian herbal medicine. Um, that's me when I was in India back in 2012. And, you know, it's still part of the culture in India today, although currently it's still illegal even for medical use. So what do all these uh, cultures have in common? Well, they all use cannabis as a medicine and also some of them use it recreationally. And in the U.S., hemp was considered the most important cash crop um, in the late 1700s and the 1800s. So, you know, before the whole prohibition thing happened, this was actually a really important crop. And people always say to me, you know, because I prescribe cannabis medicines in Canada and now I'm training the, the doctors over here, oh, there's, there's no evidence it's, you know, for its use in depression, anxiety, uh, insomnia. There's been no traditional use of that. Well, it's actually not true. There's been documented Victorian um, medical doctors in the UK who were using it back in the 1800s and documenting its use for these conditions. It's not new. But we have a man named Harry Anzingler who is um, really instrumental in turning a perfectly acceptable botanical medicine uh, and moralizing and then demonizing this plant. And it really had to do with more economic reasons, political reasons. After the end of prohibition, there was no more alcohol and they needed something else to kind of, you know, become uh, the new scapegoat. And there was a lot of other economic factors at play. So they created a huge campaign, quite a, a racist campaign, quite a, um, you know, a, an untrue campaign against cannabis, um, reefer badness. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's quite funny, actually. Have a look on YouTube. The New York Academy of Medicine in 1944 did an extensive review of the potential harms of cannabis and found that it did not cause a psychosis or hysteria or these things that they were promoting it to cause, but it was ignored. And this was the most respected medical body of the time. And they just kind of pushed this report under the table. Um, then in 1971, it was removed from the British Pharmacopoeia as a medication. So these two guys, you know, looking to change that. Um, obviously, uh, Raphael Michellum, he discovered THC and CBD in the 60s. And then they went on together to work on the endocannabinoid system in the late 80s. And in 1992, really identifying our first endocannabinoid, which is called anandamide. It's this natural cannabis molecule we produce in our bodies. And that explains why cannabis works. So, you know, for ages we were like, why does THC make people feel intoxicated and also relieve pain and muscle spasm? Well, it's because we have a built-in system in our bodies to use uh, cannabinoids, both from the plant and ones that we make ourselves. It does things that we like to call eat, sleep, relax, protect, and forget. So basically, you know, it's arguably 
arguably the most important biological system we have in our bodies and our brains. And there's receptors for this system in every single organ in our bodies, in our immune system, in our bone marrow. And it works on these different receptors. Um, THC favors this one type of receptor called CB1, although it does contact more than that. CBD, cannabidiol, we used to think that it worked on the CB2 receptors, but now we actually know it, it kind of moves around and kind of um, does sprinkles its magic over the whole system. And it also works on other systems in the brain and the body, um, like serotonin, like vanilloid receptors, like these things called orphan receptors. We don't really know what they do yet. So CBD actually works on so many different levels and it kind of helps balance the whole system. So it helps regulate our endocannabinoid system. Um, this is me when I graduated from medical school. So this is the day before we entered our first do jobs as doctors and in the hospital and really exciting times. That's us probably out at the bar after we graduated. And the endocannabinoid system was missing in action. And this was back in 2008, 2009 when I first started practicing medicine. And back then, medical cannabis was already available in Canada for 10 years, but we didn't know about it. No one told me about this in medical school. No one talked about it. We didn't know we could prescribe cannabis. Are you kidding me? We didn't even learn about the system that made it work in our own brains and bodies. We also got half a day of nutrition uh, training in medical school, so that explains a lot. Um, I had to do all that training afterwards in another postdoctoral fellowship. So I went out to BC and I was, you know, a keen young doctor and, you know, really excited and I was really interested in holistic medicine and I was doing all this extra training. I moved out to British Columbia and I started working in a few communities out there that were using cannabis for years and years already. A lot of my patients were putting it through their juicer in the morning. They had a lot of land in some of the Gulf Islands and they were growing cannabis and juicing it. And these were people in their 90s who were really healthy. You know, I'm not saying it's all down to cannabis, but, you know, I mean, they got to be doing something right because they were on no medications, most of my patients on some of these Gulf Islands, and they were still, you know, on their farms. And um, I got really interested in this. And I started to have these patients and working with the local herbalist there who was not a doctor, um, making cannabis tinctures for my patients, you know, before I was actually prescribing it um, to help them with, uh, you know, cancer pain when they were in the end stages of their life and they were on tons of morphine and it was making them feel pretty awful and really impacting their ability to spend that quality time with their friends and their families in the final part of their life. So I had a lot of experience with my patients using it and um, then I became a patient myself. So I had a really bad accident. Um, I flew through the air into Superman position. I was hit by a motorcycle when I was jogging and I blew all the ligaments in my hand. So I saw three great surgeons on three different continents, all trained at Harvard. They did a bunch of surgeries on me and um, it didn't really work. Uh, I was told I'd have nerve pain for life. I was told I was not gonna have a functioning left hand, um, all of these things. And um, I had really bad nerve pain actually that would keep me up at night. So I decided not to take any of the medications they recommended and you know, see what else I could do. So the first thing I did was I did a lot of my own um, things I was already doing with my patients. I meditated, I did a lot of mind body stuff which helped deal um, with the pain as far as coping with it, but it was still there. So then I went to my medical conference that I go to every year that I've spoken at now about cannabis medicine. And one of uh, my colleagues who's a psychiatrist in the US said to me, well, why don't you try cannabis? And I said, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, at this point I was trained as a medical herbalist as well, I should mention that. I was already prescribing every other herbal therapy alongside drugs in my practice, but I was still really worried about prescribing cannabis because it was the same thing in Canada back then as it was now in the UK. The college was breathing down our necks saying, oh, you can't, you can't prescribe that. And you know, what, what, what happened to us? They might take away our license all this kind of stuff. So long story short, I decided at the conference, which was in California, to try this topical cannabis bomb. So I started putting it on my, you know, my wrist. And by the end of the week, I wasn't waking up anymore from my nerve pain for the first time in almost a year. So I was like, well, okay, that, that pretty much seals the deal. I guess I have to add this to my practice. So I went back to Canada and I started prescribing medical cannabis. That was the final kind of push that I needed. And 
these are all the things I've treated with medical cannabis. I've treated thousands of patients in Canada. Um, I've trained medical students. I've trained physicians in Canada. Now I've done it in the UK. Um, moved over, back over here last year. I'm also from the UK originally, my dad anyways. So it was kind of like coming home. And, you know, a lot of my patients, they were in their 60s. They had never tried cannabis. They weren't stoners. Most of my patients didn't want to get high. They just wanted something for their pain or their sleep or their anxiety. And they tried a lot of other things already. And they just weren't happy with the current available uh, drugs that were being prescribed. So, you know, I started treating a lot of these conditions. And it, the results I was getting were quite incredible. I had patients who had, you know, insomnia for 20 years. They were on every sleeping pill under the sun and they'd also tried meditation. They tried all the natural stuff. They'd been to see a psychiatrist. They still couldn't sleep. And we got them on cannabis and they were sleeping for the first time. And my patients with chronic pain were able to do things again. I had, you know, some of my patients with chronic pain in their 60s, otherwise healthy, they couldn't pick up their grandchildren. And all of a sudden they can do these things that not just is a functional skill for them, but it actually changes their whole life. So I became a real advocate for this. I treated patients with uh, epilepsy who were basically zombies when I saw them in the beginning. And you know, I'm not against anti-epileptic medication, of course, but we were able to wean these patients down and titrate up their cannabis and they became functional. Um, they had a life again and it changed their entire family dynamic. Um, I had one young man who was in his early 20s who was told he would have to live in an institution for the rest of his life. His mother had had to quit her job to look after him. They were, you know, they, they had no money. It, it, it just destroyed their family, this illness, and they had no support. We got him on the cannabis a year later. He was able to have a therapy dog. He was able to move out, get his own apartment, have a part-time job. And this was something that was told he would never be able to accomplish in his life. Um, so it, it was quite incredible, you know, what, what was going on. So what about hemp CBD? Hemp CBD has come onto the scene a little bit later, um, more recently, and I also work on the wellness side. So I have a wellness part of my practice. And it's incredible what we can do even with hemp-based CBD products. Um, these are things that you know I've, I've used hemp-based CBD products for, especially here in the UK where at the moment, something we're working on, but at the moment, getting a medical cannabis prescription in this country, although technically possible, is almost practically impossible and extremely extortionally expensive. Um, you know, so we're you know we're working on that, and in the meantime, we have we have a lot of hemp-based CBD products. And of course, you know, these are all the different delivery systems we can use with with cannabis products. And I'm just going to go through. Ah, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, actually. But one, one point I do want to make is what we're seeing now in the industry, especially the hemp industry, is we're seeing um, all these kind of new technologies for making CBD more bioavailable. And it's really, really important because cannabinoids, CBD and THC, and the other cannabinoids in the plant, of which there are many, and some of them are actually quite important, and we're just beginning to be able to um, utilize them and use strains that are higher in some of these trace cannabinoids, they're all what we call um, lipophilic, meaning they're water-hating, fat-loving. So when we need to get them into the body, it's difficult without using some of these high-tech carriers. And that's why it's so um, interesting and cool and exciting what we can now begin to do with hemp-based CBD and medical cannabis to get more active cannabinoids into the actual bloodstream where they're needed. Um, ah. This is a really busy graph. It's not to overwhelm you, it's just to point out that all of the, um, the compounds featured on this graph are non-intoxicating. So these are all the things we can do without THC. I think that's really cool. I mean, you know, this is one of the plants we know the most about as far as the biological activity of all the different hundreds of chemicals in this one botanical medicine. I use a lot of other botanical medicines too, and we often don't really know more than one or two compounds in that plant that's biologically active. So, you know, this plant has so much potential. Um, these are some of the things that CBD can do, some of the properties that it has. This is very much dose dependent. So a lot of people will say to me, oh, I've tried to have base CBD product, didn't work. You know, I always recommend full spectrum products for hemp-based CBD products because they have only trace THC, if any, depending on the product. Um, you don't have that synergy with the THC. 
So you often need higher doses if you're actually trying to treat a medical condition versus just for general wellness. So it's really, you know, what you're trying to do with it. CBD, in my um, opinion, is an adaptogen. Adaptogens in herbal medicine are things that help the body adapt to chronic stress. And we actually really need these things in modern life because we are not cut out. Our brains and our bodies are not made to handle chronic stress. And unfortunately, the chronic stress burden is increasing, not decreasing. And um, CBD can help us adapt to stress better in many circumstances. And I use it along with other adaptogens like ashwagandha, uh, mushrooms. There's all kinds of them. Okay, I'm going to skip through these. Okay, myth busting time. So I always get asked this question more so about six months ago than now. I think the word is getting out that this is not the case, but CBD does not ever convert to THC in the body. Ever, ever, ever. There was one study done in a Petri dish where they put THC in really acidic conditions and they turned it into CBD from this weird pathway that does not happen in the body ever, ever, ever. So I'm just putting that one to rest. Hemp and cannabis are the same plant. It, they've been cultivated, just like heirloom tomatoes have been cultivated to be different colors and have different flavors over the years. Cannabis is the same thing. It's the same plant, um, but it's been cultivated and has different strains, different chemovars, cultivars, uh, THC content, that sort of thing. Um, oh, actually, there's one more. Ah, I'll talk about it on this one. Okay, so modern cannabis everyone has married their cousin and everyone's all related now. So there's no pure sativas really anymore. There's no pure indicas really anymore. And then what does that actually mean? Because if you look at the cultivar or the chemovar, the chemical makeup, the terpene profile of these plants, it gets really murky. Um, there's a researcher by the name of uh, Arno Hazekamp in the Netherlands, and he's done some really cool papers on this. Uh, he's a guy to look up if you're interested in this, this whole debate. He's one of the kind of the thought leaders on it, and I know him quite well, and we always have this conversation whenever I see him. Um, one thing I often get asked about with CBD, hemp CBD in particular, is people say, oh, it's, it's sedating. It, you know, when I take a lot of CBD, I, I'm worried it's going to make me sleepy. CBD does not make people sleepy in itself. It depends on the strain and the terpene profile. Um, it can help calm people down. It helps with anxiety, but it's not going to make you groggy or impair your driving or make you fall asleep in that sense. This is a cluster of symptoms known as the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. This is a, it was a theory pioneered by a colleague of mine called Dr. Ethan Russo in Canada, um, who some of you probably heard about. Back in 2006, when he first wrote a paper about it, no one was really paying attention and everyone thought he was a bit wacky, but uh, I thought, oh, maybe there's something to this. And what I found treating these disorders, because in integrated medicine, I get people who have a lot of orphan symptoms and I totally believe that they are real and that there are um, neuroimmunological problems going on. So the immune system and the nervous system not working properly together. And um, these things really overlap and there's no drugs that deal with them well, in my opinion. And when I treat people with cannabis with these problems, they respond incredibly well. So the theory goes like this. Oh, where's that slide? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, we're out of order a bit. Okay, so we all have this thing called the base endocannabinoid tone. So the endocannabinoid system, it's the balancing system of our brain and our body. So it's keeping everything in check. It's something that scientists call homeostasis. So... If you have a functional endocannabinoid system for whatever reason, lots of body systems can get out of whack, our hormone systems can get out of whack. Um, the endocannabinoid system is similar. Um, genes, environment, all these things influence our system. And a decreased tone in the system can potentially lead to these overlapping clusters of disorders. And there's some studies done in, um, in migraine sufferers that when they take spinal fluid from them, the level of cannabinoid, the endocannabinoids are different in migraine sufferers versus non-migraine headache sufferers. Oh, same with PTSD as well. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the condition-based areas that I work with. And I've chosen ones that I use both medical cannabis and CBD hemp, since this is the hemp CBD show. Um, what to do with cannabis in anxiety. So 
a lot of my patients um, who come to see me on the medical side and a lot of people who just message me through social media in the UK are often uh, self-medicating with cannabis, uh, black market cannabis, because uh, you know, truthfully, that's the only thing that is um, available and affordable. And sometimes they're using it for anxiety. A lot of the time they are. And a lot of times if you over-medicate with THC over a chronic period of time, because of what's called the biphasic effect of THC on anxiety, people's anxiety can get worse and you can get what's called rebound anxiety. Um, so I advise people who suffer from anxiety to start with a hemp-based CBD product. If you're going to add THC, you really want to do it low dose and um, oral versus vaped because vaped, when you have THC vaped, it, it spikes the levels in the brain really quickly. And um, for general anxiety control, long-term prevention, decreasing arousal levels of the nervous system, better to stay high CBD, low THC generally. Terpenes can also help here too. Myrcene, linalool, uh, terpenoline, that kind of stuff. Okay, can uh, cannabis and sleep. There we go. I'm going to switch. So CBD alone can increase wakefulness in some people, not in everybody. So how do I deal with this? Well, the first thing is in medical cannabis, when I'm dealing with hardcore insomnia, these people, you know, they, are, they need massive sleep support. They're on the maximal sleep pills for years. I usually do add some THC. It's really helpful. Um, on the hemp side of things, I add um, other herbs, sleepy herbs. I add things like uh, valerian, passion flower, hops, skull cap, um, sometimes Jamaican dogwood and other, you know, more hyp hypnotic herbs. And the other way that we can use it for sleep on the hemp side is insomnia, especially that is stress-based, that has a stress-based component, it's a disorder of 24-hour hyper-arousal of the nervous system. It's not just at night. So we notice sleeping problems when we go to sleep, but the nervous system is dysfunctional all the time. So we can use CBD products to support calming the nervous system throughout the daytime. So you take a dose in the morning, you take a dose in the mid-afternoon, you take a dose with dinner time. And that way, we're not all ramped up by the time we're trying to go to sleep and expecting our brains just to completely magically shut off. Unfortunately, our brains don't really work like that. So that's really the, the take home message here. Um, if you're trying to take a CBD oil right before you go to bed and hoping it's gonna solve your insomnia, some people say it does help because um, we're all a little bit different, but that's generally not the best way to use it for sleep. Um, generally, you want to take it throughout the day, and if you're taking it at night, you want to use it with other herbs or with THC. Um, when it comes to stress, helping with stress, both on the CBD wellness side and the medical cannabis side, less is more when it comes to THC here too. CBD is an adaptogen. Adaptogens also mean CBD um, is very safe and you can't really overdo it. THC has a, a sweet spot. And, um, you know, not everyone wants to use THC and you, not everyone needs to use THC. But if you are going to use it on the medical side of things, then if you um, exceed that sweet spot of THC and the ratio of THC to CBD is wrong, i.e. too much THC usually, uh, and sometimes it's strain dependent, terpene dependent as well, then it can make your nervous system more stressed. It can bring it away from the balance instead of towards the balance. Um, chronic fatigue and ME, this is one of my specialty areas in integrative medicine. Um, and I do use cannabinoids as part of my protocol for chronic fatigue, along with a lot of other things. It's not a cure, but it definitely helps. Um, one of the theories is that, uh, which I subscribe to, is that there's an element of mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are the things in our cells that make our energy and they can become dysfunctional. And in chronic fatigue, it's not just feeling a bit tired, it's like a circuit breaker is flipped the wrong way in the brain and the body and people do not make enough energy anymore. It's, it's really, it's a real diagnosis. Um, one of my most um, hated things that I hear from doctors, and it's worse in the UK actually, is um, telling people to do graded exercise for chronic fatigue. That really, ooh, that really gets me going because it doesn't work and it's actually detrimental and it makes people worse. Um, and the NHS is still kind of, you know, uh, uh, often recommending this treatment. 
So with chronic fatigue, it's a tired but wired nervous system. Cannabinoids can help because there's definitely some endocannabinoid system dysfunction. Um, and, you know, it just start, start, uh, start low, go slow approach. And you can start with CBD. Migraine um, is really interesting because if you give someone too much pure CBD too quickly for migraine, it can make their migraine worse. If they're already having an onset of a migraine, so for long-term prevention and you want to decrease the migraine frequency over time, I use a high CBD oil. This is on the medical cannabis side, or you could use a hemp-based CBD oil, but you want to slowly increase the dose over time, like weeks, because too much too quickly can trigger a migraine in some people, not in everybody. And then when you have an attack on the medical side in Canada, I use uh, vaporized cannabis, usually a balanced strain with THC and CBD. And in the studies for migraine sufferers, there's one strain in particular that's high in beta carophylline and uh, myrcene that's been used for migrainers with really good efficacy called OG Shark. So that's one you can kind of look for. Women's health and CBD. So I'm writing a book right now about medical cannabis and about CBD and um, one of the trickiest chapters so far has been women's health chapter because there's not a lot of research. So I've had a lot of clinical experience in these areas with cannabinoids and my clinical experience is ahead of the research. So it becomes tricky. But we do know that having a dysfunctional endocannabinoid system affects all of these women's health problems, PMS, period pain, um, post, uh, basically premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, which is a, a mood disorder when people get, their mood gets really affected before their period, um, endometriosis, PCOS. What we do know actually about these things, um, sorry to blind you with this slide, but I'll explain it, um, is that we know for sure that in all of the disorders I just mentioned, all the women's health hormonal issues, there's, the endocannabinoid system is getting involved here. There's something wrong going on in the brain level. So in the brain, we have receptors for cannabinoids in the area of the brain that controls our women's hormone cycles. The hypothalamus is one of those areas. Um, and the anterior pituitary is another one of those areas. So how can cannabinoids help? That is less clear, but it seems that CBD is the safer of the two. Um, THC can help with there we go. THC has been pretty well studied preliminarily, like some preliminary studies to help with endometriosis pain. I've used it for this clinically in my patients. They've had good efficacy, um, you know, THC containing medical cannabis. But the downside is we don't know if THC may affect fertility, especially at higher doses. Um, so if someone is trying to become pregnant, especially if they're 35 or over, or if they've already been told in the couple or in the female that they have uh, fertility issues, I don't recommend THC containing cannabis at this time, um, at least until we understand it better. So far, THC seems to potentially in some people shorten the second phase of the menstrual cycle. So, so far, CBD seems fine, but again, we're really at the beginning of our research here. So we wanna be a little bit careful. Um, PCOS, there's some preliminary research that suggests that polycystic ovarian syndrome, a lot of THC may not be beneficial here either. But again, we don't know for sure. And we have to weigh it against the fact that for period pain and for endometriosis pain, um, when you add THC, it can be really beneficial when other things have failed for pain control. So it's, it's always a balance. And these are the kinds of tricky conversations I have to have with my patients. Um, Fifteen minutes. I think what I'll do is okay. Yeah, sh Q and A. No, it's okay. It's okay. 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 I'm gonna do a few more slides. Then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So, what are the potential side effects and cautionaries for hemp-based CBD? So, this is. CBD products with uh, below or THC levels at or below 0.2%. There's really not a lot of risk here, guys. I mean, it's so safe. You could drink an entire bottle of any of the vendors here and nothing bad would happen to you. 
there, I've said it. It's probably shouldn't say that on, as a medical doctor. It's probably some medical legal problem with that. But um, really, I mean, it's, it's really safe. Um, the only thing you got to be a little bit careful about is if you're on blood thinners, there's a theoretical risk, okay, of it thinning your blood a little further. So when I have patients on blood thinners and they've just had a heart attack or stroke, something really serious, I'm really cautious because we just don't know yet exactly what the threshold is for that interaction. Um, the other area I'm cautious with is if someone's on seizure medication, I'm testing their levels, especially in the beginning, because it can interact with the same pathways that break down the seizure medication. So it's fine to use them together, but it should be done under medical supervision. Um, People always say, well, how much does it start to interact the seizure pill medications? Some seizure pills, it affects more than others, but generally um, of daily, daily doses under 80, probably to 100 milligrams of CBD total per day, it's probably not gonna have a significant effect on the seizure drug levels, but it does vary, so it should be approached with caution and with a medical doctor. Of course, the problem is that we can't get a hold of it here with a medical doctor, so. That's quite problematic for people with seizures. Um, so these are some of the positive side effects I've seen in my practice. Um, when I present at conferences, especially on medical cannabis, which I also do, uh, to my colleagues, so you know at more of an academic uh, physician conference, I always get asked about, oh, the, the side effects, and you know, one of them always being, what about intoxication? What about euphoria? Euphoria is the side effect that Western doctors seem to really worry about. It's like, really? We're worried about euphoria? We give people things that make them feel really bad and we're worried about, anyways. Um, in my medical practice since introducing medical cannabis, I have been able to get my patients to meditate more, to change their lifestyle more because it's a catalyst for making them feel a bit better so they can actually do those things. Because if you're stuck in a cycle of fatigue, severe pain and depression, good luck trying to engage your brain with cognitive behavioral therapy or meditation. It's not happening. And it's not a just try harder approach. It, it just doesn't work. That's just not reality. So I've seen people return to work. I've not seen my patients get lazier with cannabis. That's another stereotype. Um, and I even held this myself. You know, we're taught in medical school that cannabis is going to make people have psychotic episodes and lead to these lazy stoners everywhere. And no, instead, I've had people on long-term disability return to work for the first time in 10 years. So it's actually increased their functionality, increased their productivity levels, and that's really, really cool and interesting, and I think we need to talk more about that. Um, we also reduced their pill burden in chronic disease. So, you know, like I said, I'm not anti-drug, but if we can reduce the number of drugs people have to take and reduce their side effects, why not? I mean, that's what we should be doing. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're supposed to do as doctors, improve people's quality of life. When we can't cure somebody, let's make them feel better and improve their quality of life. Um, this is not my actual patient, but the gentleman uh, on top there with the horse, I have a, a lovely rancher as one of my patients, and he's in his 70s, and um, he lives on a ranch in Alberta. And he came to see me because he had really bad arthritis, and he was on lots of opioids, uh, painkillers for that and he couldn't take anti-inflammatories because he has chronic kidney disease and he couldn't get on his horse anymore because the opioids were messing with his his brain function and he was just feeling really awful and he got really depressed common theme with chronic pain they can't do the things they love anymore so it's depressing um, so he's on antidepressants so we got him on cannabis um, we got him on an oil um, lots of CBD a little bit of THC and he I do a lot of video telemedicine and he took me, um, his rancher helper had, you know, a video of him taking me on a little uh, journey with him on his horse for the first time in over a few years. So he's back on his horse, on his ranch, doing what he loves. It's completely changed his life. And um, the drum set is another patient of mine who was a professional drummer. He was in quite a well-known band back in the 90s. And he has really bad arthritis that's autoimmune and his hands were so gnarled up when I saw him. He hadn't worked for years. He was on disability. He was really depressed too, because you can imagine your whole life's about music, and all of a sudden you can't play anymore, you can't do gigs, and you've lost your, your income. So we got him on cannabis, and six months after we got him going, he had improved so much um, that he had redone his, his home practice room, and he surprised me with it on a video telemedicine call. He's way up in northern British Columbia, and um, he surprised me 
uh, like, you know, in a call and he played a song for me in his new room and made me cry. Um, you know, I mean, this is, this is what I went into medicine for and I can honestly say that I can't tell any of these stories from giving people an anti-inflammatory or an SSRI for their depression. It just doesn't happen. Like, people don't say, this has changed my life. Um, so it's a pretty unique um, tool and I am so pleased to be a part of this movement and um, I will be taking questions if you want to come find me at the collective hemp booth after I'm going to migrate over there um, happy to take questions over there thank you so much and I'll take questions here for a bit first okay. ladies and gentlemen Dr. Danny so thank you hi thanks for the talk okay. um, I just wondered are there any other plants or natural sources of cannabinoids or trace cannabinoids other than the cannabis plant itself? There are, but not in the same percentages. So there's certain cannabinoid, um, cannabinoid molecules that can be found in some other plants. Um, but in general, the cannabis plant is where most of them exist in enough quantity to be used and harvested. Um, there's been some people who have worked on making uh, cannabinoids in a lab out of yeast and things like this but we haven't got to the point yet where it's usable technology but you know it, it, it's there's lots of possibilities i think for the future yeah anyone else of course. so i'm from the u.s also um and i'm curious what do you think are the major barriers here of why why this is not more usable why are there not more studies why with all this evidence and and patients you know giving these stories why not put it into studies why not compare it to the standard so there's the biggest reason and i think the common enemy of the whole industry has been prohibition for the last 60 years where we've demonized this plant and it's been impossible to study it um so that set us back 30 30 years um so we're that's the first problem Second problem is that the way that we now study things is called the RCT model. It's a randomized controlled trial, which is really, um, it's really a tool for a drug development funnel, like a pharmaceutical drug development funnel. I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but really a randomized controlled trial is best suited to study a single ingredient pharmaceutical agent not a botanical medicine where there's hundreds of compounds, hundreds of um, ways of applying it, um, dozens of delivery, modes of delivery. So this is the other problem. So we have those two problems on the evidence-based side, and then we have the problem with teaching medical students about it. Um, we still barely learn about the endocannabinoid system in medical school, if at all. So you know, if our physicians don't know about it, then they're not gonna prescribe it. And then we have, on top of these things, the whole moralistic argument that cannabis is bad, cannabis is for stoners. Um, this is this is the other thing we really have to counter. So there's lots of lots of things that are coming into this, um, and it's all things we're going to overcome. It's going to take time, and I think the best way to do it is to educate, um, support, support research, support medical schools educating, which I'm starting to get involved with it with Imperial College. Uh, here in the UK and um, the other thing is working with with government and you know just trying to build bridges really yeah okay any one uh, two final questions we have uh, anyone else yes sir uh, really good speech by the way um, so for those that hasn't tried CBD yet um, how, how would you recommend them go about using CBD? So, as you know, over here in the UK, you can't go to a doctor and say, look, I want to try CBD. Yeah. How, how would someone like, you know, I've got arthritis, how would I go about using CBD? So, it's really going to be person to person dependent as far as dosage goes. Um, it really depends on the what you want to use it for, what results you want to get, and the product itself. There's no homogenization of products now available in the market. That's part of the problem. Um, I'm actually here launching my own line for this very reason. So, you know, when I have my products, I'm going to be able to speak to how to dose those. And I've, I also combine them with other botanicals. But in general, a general guideline is, um, you know, it's more about saving money rather than uh, taking too heavy of a dose. It's so safe that you could take 50 milligrams, you could take 100 milligrams, but really, you know, you can start by taking maybe shoot from between 10 to 30 milligrams a day um, for wellness purposes and go from there. Thank yeah. You. 
Okay. Any more? Hi. Uh, you mentioned about your experience in the uh, area of mental health research. And so, you mentioned your experience in mental health research yes. in, in, in that area, and you mentioned people with depression. I just wondered about uh, the experience of people with uh, symptoms, of pe uh, people who are diagnosed bipolar, schizophrenia, and those kind of conditions, and how, how it's been used in, in that way. Yeah. So for anyone with a family history of schizophrenia and a first degree relative or suffer from a psychotic episode themselves or even a manic episode, I don't prescribe any THC. Um, you know, would it throw someone into a manic episode every time? Certainly not. Um, but from a medical, because I have my medical license, I have to be very careful. I have to, anything I do has to be defendable in a court of my peers many of who don't believe in cannabis still. Um, and I think it is the safest thing to do to stick to CBD only. CBD is mood balancing for both bipolar and for schizophrenia. There's been a few studies where it's been added on to conventional antipsychotics and it's helped um, stabilize schizophrenia. Um, it reduces the, if someone's using cannabis on the black market and they add CBD um, or they switch strains to a higher CBD content, they're reducing their risk. I'm also all about risk reduction for all drugs. So I think even if we can get the message across that someone's using black market cannabis, they have a history of psychosis or mania, if we can educate them that they should be looking for, ideally, even on the black market, if they can get a product that's tested, that's higher CBD, or mixing CBD flour into their vaporizer with THC, that's gonna reduce the risk of having that happen. The risk of a psychotic episode is probably in the realm of between one in 4,000 to one in 10,000. And it really depends on the amount of THC you take, other factors that are going on, probably even sleep deprivation, all these other things. Um, and um, probably one of the biggest risks uh, with especially untested products is spice. So synthetic cannabinoids in the brain bind, they like glom on to these CB1 receptors really tightly and they don't let go. That seems to be much higher risk for creating a psychotic episode or a manic episode. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. once again, Dr. Danny Gordon, thank you so much. Thank you.